I am going on air live now, about 15 minutes prior to game time, so that I can go ahead and make sure everything's cool, and hopefully get some recruiting done, because at this point, no one's actually signed up. That's all right. People are, you know, it's it was a new idea, just launched a couple of days ago, really, mostly yesterday. And uh, I know I keep looking down, but the reason I'm looking down is I'm just sort of like checking the screen to make sure everything's like what it should be and stuff. And uh, live recording for broadcast is kind of those weird things. You should be paying a direct attention to the camera at all times, but then you want to look and see all the stuff going on the screen, which that's how that is. So anyway, yeah, I am um, prepared to run for up to four players. And I even have the link to send out to folks so they can pop on as essentially co-hosts. Uh, and that way, you know, with camera and microphone, they can pop in and be live as players in this game. So now I'm just going to go ahead and get the word out to folks. Do, do, do. So hopefully some folks out there will be interested in playing with us. This is a new idea. I don't know that anyone's ever quite done this before. A whole series of one hour demos live and online that people can pop in and join and play. Apex and Killer Robots in Pinnacle City. Come play a live demo with me right now on Kickstarter. I don't multitask well, so typing while talking, kind of hard for me. I apologize for that. But I'm just trying to kind of get the word out to folks so that maybe someone will join in and come play with me. Come along and play with me. What the heck am I looking at right now? Wow. That's just... Yeah, it's an image of a woman with not even a chainmail bikini, literally steel cups on her boobs. It's a cartoon. And it looks like she's biting her own underarm pit. I don't know. This is really weird. It's a really bizarre cartoon that I'm seeing. I'm on G plus right now. G plus is going away, but it's still active right now. So I'm, you know, just that is some real interesting stuff I just saw. <laughs> uh, do do do. Oh, wait, sorry. That's not what I want to do. Share, share link. Mm -hmm. I am just getting this out there. Come play with me, come play a game with me. Not sure what else I can do. Putting the word out, people come play a game. We'll hope that, that somebody decides they want to come play. I'm going to go ahead and broadcast this. Coffee, coffee, coffee. All right, I got my coffee, I got my water.
All right. I think I've done about all I can do. So we'll see if anyone's going to come play. So right now it doesn't look like anybody's on, but that's okay. It hasn't actually technically started yet. But anyway, for those who for some reason don't know what I'm talking about or what's going on here, and they've just tuned in for the very first time, this is Evil Beagle Games Kickstarter for Prowlers and Paragons Ultimate Edition. This is a superhero game that I am deeply, deeply in love with and very proud to be a co-designer of Leonard Pimentel, Len Pimentel, Vice President of Evil Legal Games, President of Lakeside Games, one of the most brilliant game designers I have ever encountered and worked with, uh, is the main creator and designer. He designed the original Prowls and Paragons, which a lot of people really love and enjoy. It ended up on quite a few uh, number, you know, top five and top ten lists for superhero games. This game is a massive teardown and rebuild of that original system. That one was a little beer and pretzel-y, a little bit, with a heavy emphasis on narrative gameplay. We maintained that emphasis on narrative gameplay, like a whole hell of a lot. This is, we like to call it the perfect fusion of classic and modern game design. Uh, you do not have to play this as a uh, a narrative player empowered uh, game kind of thing. You can play entirely traditional and classic. The rules are baked right in there for that kind of experience. At the same time, you totally can. And what's best about it is you can do both. For the players who really love the concept of of immersive player empowered narrative input, the rules allow you to do that, while at the same time, somebody else who's much more of a traditionalist can play their style, and they do not conflict in any way, shape, or form. And you can even choose, you know, scene to scene. It's like, ah, go ahead and describe it for me. Uh, or, nope, I want to I want to take the narrative and, and describe it. You know, both those styles are, totally, are equally valid and equally playable at the game. Um, it's an incredibly simple and intuitive basic game system, but the depth of it in terms of what you can create and what you can play and the maneuvers you can do and the things you can try. It's, it's solid. The crunch is there. It's just, it's very easy, tasty crunch. This is not like deep and, and drowning. Um, frankly, a description that, that I and some others use is that what Savage Worlds is to GURPS, uh, Prowls and Paragons would be to Champions. Now that's to not say anything bad about either GURPS or Champions. In fact, those are both fantastic games, groundbreaking incredibly important to the games industry and the hobby. Uh, and and people who play those games and enjoy those games have an enormous amount of fun. Uh, I've got friends who still love running ch and playing champions. I was the champions, high priest hero of hero, you know, the guru kind of guy. Uh, and and that system, along with a lot of other great games, had a massive influence on PNP. But the modern thinking is much more along the lines of let's get something that's a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier for new players to dive into. If we're trying to bring people over from uh, Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition, they want to try some superhero gaming. We want to give them something that they can just grab and go. So for example, if a character has a 12 die energy blast in this game, they pick up and roll 12 D six, 12 six sided dice. And then they just count all the even dice. Each even die counts as a success. Sixes count double. That's it. That's the core game. If you know how to do that, if you can do that, you can play this game. Everything else flows right off of that and very easily and intuitively so. For those of you who are more architects and engineers with your character building and your gameplay, the, the rules will let you delve uh, and dive deep. 
But for those of you who's like, man, I just want to run up and hit it or blast it or whatever, you can do that too. And both styles are totally valid and both will be satisfying experiences. So as a, you know, kind of a quick little intro kind of thing while we wait for official start and to see if anybody's actually going to come and play today. So I'm just going to check on Facebook to see if I've got anybody who's uh, wanting to join in or has sent me anything. Uh, okay, we add that one to the timeline. I'll go ahead and add it to the timeline. And add that one to the timeline. All right, so I just had to check. There's all this stuff that Facebook makes you check before it'll actually show up and whatever. Uh, but I'm just checking to see if there's anybody out there who has said in other places that they are inclined to come and join us. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> That's a completely separate thing, and I can't repeat that. <laughs> Okay, so there's this really cool thing on Facebook, uh, and I'm not that's not actually what I was laughing at, but there's this other cool thing on Facebook that uh, Michael Walsh, one of our um, uh, supporters, uh, sh has showed us. It's got uh, a beautiful um, photoshopped image of John Wick from like what you know, John the John Wick movies, Keanu Reeves in an Avengers basically what I would call the microverse suit. If I'm understanding what they're going to be doing, uh, they're going to jump into the microverse and, and do some stuff. And he's got that special like white and, and cool trim uh, outfit on. And the it's a meme basically. And it says purple alien snaps fingers, dog disappears, John wick end game. So uh, yeah, that could be interesting. I mean, you know, John wick's going to need some really big guns. I would say to pull that off. But, uh, you know, uh, that, and that was one of the things that came up. I recently did a go live that was, uh, all about what, you know, what, what can I make? Um, and, uh, there was a whole thing about, uh, you know, John Wick as a superhero. Now, there's two ways to approach that. Like, you make John Wick exactly as you imagine him in the movie, and then you realize that he's not necessarily going to be able to fight Superman or whatever. Or what happens if John Wick is a paranormal uh, in a superhero world, even if he's like a low-power paranormal? That's how I'd build him, just so that he was a little bit more Nick Fury-esque in his ability to, like, you know, dance with the superhero types. Um, so I would actually allow John to have, like, sevens and eights and maybe even nine dice and a couple of things here and there. Uh, just to kind of put him in the ballpark where he could really do some amazing stuff. But he'd be an amazing character to play in any action-adventure game. And quite frankly, PNP uh, is a superhero game, but it is an action-adventure superhero game. It can absolutely support uh, people playing all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, I, I we are playing a game right now uh, called uh, Well of the Worlds at Michael Serbrook, Chief Operations Officer of the Evil Beagles running, where you start out as six dice max characters. And then we've, we've gotten up to about seven, well, eight dice really. And uh, But we're very low powered, you know, what would be called street level in some cases, but uh, or, or heroic level. And it's an incredibly satisfying game experience. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we're really enjoying that. Whereas... Uh, in uh, another game that I'm running, uh, Storm Knights, uh, in Modern God Storm Knights, there's 18 die caps. So this is the cosmic, oh my God, blow it out game. So both of those are very satisfying. We have people. We have people here. Richard Brown, uh, Lawrence Dash Allison, Michael E., Mark Morgan, there's Corinne, a few others. What I would like to know is if any of you who are in the chat would like to play today. If so, please pop up a, a no. Actually, put it in the Q and A section specifically, so I don't lose it, and then I can give you the link that will specifically allow you to set your camera and your microphone up so that you can dive in and be one of our players today for our game. And um, at this point, since I don't have anybody, anyone is welcome. All I need you to do is make sure you grab the freebie quick start rules, and I'll uh, I'll go ahead and put a link for that in the chat just to make it nice and convenient. You want to grab that. And uh, if you hit that link, you can grab that, download it for free, totally free. 
Uh, in fact, is I think I've got a way I can like pin this v free enpue quick start rules. So if you go and grab that, it's sitting right there on the front page. You go and grab that. It's got the four pregen characters in it, which is going to be Vigilant, Alabama Slammer, Citizen Soldier, and TK. And you can pick one of those characters and play that character in the demo that I'm going to run. All I need is people with a good internet action, a good internet connection, a microphone, and a camera. And then I will give you a specific link. I will send it to you directly that will uh, allow you to come in as a co-host basically and then your camera will be you know we'll, we'll, we'll do the split screen thing and then we will have you play ah no audio uh are you saying you cannot hear me or are you saying you do not have the ability to do audio that's what i'm i'm asking mr brown um because if it's i have there's no audio of me that is a problem and i would that would be a frustrating problem at that. Um, let me actually go somewhere else where I can check to see if I am having a, if there's a problem with me. Uh, da -da. Uh, okay. So yes, I can tell that I do in fact have audio. <laughs> Uh, oh, so yes, uh, there is a, a somewhere on the screen on the main Kickstarter page, there is a, a thing that says audio muted. And uh, if you click on that, usually it's in the upper left, but it depends on what uh, browser you're using and other stuff like that. But yes, uh, just, uh, you know, so I just checked the audio is absolutely working on my end. Uh, so no, uh, no question about the fact that it is functioning uh, on that end. Um, so... Thank you, Mark Morgan, for, for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to eight and, and cool trim uh, outfit on. And the it's a meme, basically, and it says, Perp. no question about the fact that it is functioning uh, on that end. Um, so thank right. you, Mark. So yeah, um, I've also got this running as face a Facebook Live rebroadcast. Uh, so that means I need to actually be paying attention to that slightly as well, uh, which I will try to do. So I'll put that over here on the other screen so I can kind of look over and check on things while I'm over here. So Matthew Brown, I don't know which screen you're looking at, but if you are looking at the main Kickstarter page, this is broadcasting live there. And there is a, there is a thing that it automatically mutes when you come in, but if you actually, uh, move your mouse around on that screen, you should receive, you should get a, uh, well, actually, I mean, it's already there. I'm looking, I'm literally physically, my eyeballs are staring at where the thing would be on your screen right now. I'm like, let's see if I can, nope, wrong way. Uh, right there. Uh, if you were looking at the Kickstarter main page, my finger's wiggling on where your little, you know, the, the thing that looks like a speaker would be, and you would click on that and it would unmute your audio. Uh, and then down at the bottom, there's of course a speaker thing that you can do the slider on. Uh, reload the page. That's all I know to tell you, dude. I, I, I apologize sincerely. I am not an expert on, on what your setup is or how it is. I just know that I'm telling you all the things I know to tell you. Um, you know, and, and if you were, if you're, if you're looking at it, there should be a way. So just click on lots of things on your screen until you find the thing that lets you turn your sound on. I, you know, I'm saying that and you can't hear me. So it's really like ridiculous. I don't, it's, it, it's kind of dense on my part. So click on all the things on your screen. There has to be a speaker icon somewhere on there that you can activate. The page, maybe. I don't know what else to tell him. I, 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 I Matthew, I, I swear to God, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, reload the page. Reload the page. Uh, 
that's all I got. So is there anyone, because um, I know the sound's working. I've tested it. People have told me, uh, so this I'm broadcasting. People are receiving sound. So I just, I don't know what else I can tell Matthew. If anybody else has got any ideas, that would be really awesome. Um, but let's see, we've got, uh, we've got somebody, Gregory S. James. Uh, there's Jan. Uh, so uh, once again, I am, it, it, I appreciate all of you guys are here, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I am broadcasting. Um, uh, I am broadcasting it to my Sean Patrick Fannin Facebook page in case that works better for you. But uh, the thing is, I don't have anybody to... Sorry, I'm just going to see if there was somebody else that wanted to come play. Um, but we're here hanging out, and I'm good with that. And I'll just do what I normally do here, which is do 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 dancing monkey, talking about the game, woo, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm really hoping that some of you, or at least one of you, would log in and uh, act as a co-host player so that I could actually run a legitimate demo of this game. Uh, I recognize most people are either at work, so they can't do that because they're at work, but they still want to watch, or they are, you know, have family stuff going on, or their tech setup just isn't whatever. And if that's the case, you know, that's the case. Uh, I'm not, I'm not angry. I just, what this was scheduled for was so that one or more people could come on and play a character live uh, while I run a demo for you, because that's what this is about to kind of show off the game. Uh, so it could just be that this was too soon. That you know, I, we just really put the word out about this yesterday, and you know, maybe it was just too soon for people to, to plan accordingly. Um, but uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. yeah, just so, so I, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm literally, I know I'm doing that thing where we're looking at our phones, but I'm actually looking to see if there's anybody saying, "Hey, Sean, I want to come in, I want to play." Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's what that's going on. I've got people reaching out to me about you know characters they want to build. Uh, uh, so somebody who's wanting to play a game that I'm going to run for them on Monday. So I need to go ahead and hook them up with latest rules because I'm running it. There's a thing um, called Monday Night Savages we do here in Denver. Actually, it's up in Broomfield, north of Denver. And uh, it is a uh, just a gaming thing that we do every Monday. A couple of games usually going on. Uh, be, yeah. So, friend of mine, David Forby, wanted to recreate a character. I've got a bunch of pre-gens, but he actually wants to make his own character. So I'm sending him the rules that he can play with. I'm telling him 125 points and 12 decaps. So boom, just like that. That's what he needs to know. He has 125 points to spend. He can't have anything higher than 12 dice. Now he's just going to dive in and make a character. And it's going to be very easy because character building uh, is, is a thing. Um, Lynn Pimentel, as a matter of fact, did a rather awesome uh, video about making characters. And in fact, while I'm sitting here talking to you guys, I'm going to go ahead and post that in for y'all to take a look at. Lynn's character creation tutorial so that euro will take you to another live cast that we did for a while where and len was the lead guy on that one and that's where len did a whole bunch of character creation uh tutorials uh to show people how to uh to do this thing how to make characters for this game um meanwhile like i said i'm back over here and looking at uh questions going on in the facebook it is. So Michael Walsh was asking over in the Facebook thing. Uh, he was asking about the quick start rules, how complete they are. And I said, they're pretty freaking complete. They've got like everything going on in those rules. 
except character creation. That's the only thing that's not in there. Uh, so that's what you would need the, the main book for. You know, it has four pre-gens, but it has everything you need to grab those four pre-gens and play. Smart folks are going to be able to kind of reverse engineer some ideas. There's, you know, that, that should, would not really be hard if you just want to grab the quick start and see, you know, kind of tinkering, saying, I'm going to take that character and I'm going to, you know, change a couple of things. But really, I mean, you know, we're doing the Kickstarter so that we can publish a book that you guys will buy and then we can eat and, you know, feed our dogs and put yes in car and things like that, you know. So we were grateful if you can, but you will know this game by taking a look at those quick start rules and, and playing with them. I mean, that will be a thing. Um, so speaking of a thing, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I try to wear like a different hat all the time. I've got a ridiculous collection of hats. And at some point, I'm going to have to kind of cycle back in because, you know, I will eventually run out of hats. But uh, I'm going to wear each of the hats that I have once before I start wearing the same other ones over again. Because that's another Kickstarter tradition. I started that back in Shine, the, for the Shine Tower Kickstarter. Every time I did go lives or, or broadcasts, I would, uh, I would wear a different hat. Because, well, I like hats it is 112 and we've had no one volunteer to play in this demo thing that i wanted to do for which i am sorry uh because i know that's what people wanted to see today uh uh so the um sorry just checking on something else uh I, I would that that's what today was about today this was this thing was launched so that people could pop in and uh, it is one tw there, there we go that's just me checking in with the uh play in this demo thing that i wanted to do so sorry uh, da, 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 da. so yes michael they are uh so anyway, Michael was also asking if the four pregens were based on the 125.12D cap standard. So that's that is a standard, typical classic superhero game. You would imagine, you know, uh, that would be uh, early Avengers. Um, I hate to say second string Justice League, but kind of, sort of second string Justice League, not counting the 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 icons. Um, you know, uh, X Men at their solid level. Uh, the, the solid X-Men level 12 dice. You know, these are very powerful characters. 12 dice is a is nothing to sneeze at. That is a very, very solid, powerful character. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, somebody with 12 dice of might is going to uh, regularly be able to pick up 100 tons. The, the 100 tons, right? That's That's a thing. You know, so that's 12 dice. Uh, 12 dice super speed or 12 dice of running. Let me find the thing to explain that one. Do, 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 do. Let me find it. Uh, there's a section for that. And it's very, it's, it's meant to be inherently abstract. And then you know, when you want the, the specifics, a 12 dice speed means you are running at 10,000 miles per hour with a 12 dice of super speed or a 12 dice of running or 12 dice flight, you're flying at 10,000 miles an hour. Uh, so those are very powerful, solid, oh my gosh, characters. And that's the standard. Uh, for GMs who are looking more for a Netflix uh, era uh, Marvel game, you're probably talking nine or 10 dice. Like, I mean, Luke Cage, I actually, I would say call that a nine die game where Luke Cage is probably gonna have armor of nine die. Uh, you know, uh, definitely, uh, um, Daredevils can have nine dice agility and nine dice martial arts. Um, Jessica is Jessica Drew is going to have um, nine dice might. Maybe even give her ten dice might. I don't know. Uh, just so she has that one thing that she's like, oh gosh, um, and so on and so forth. So I mean, that's that's going to be a slightly lower lower campaign level. Um, whereas uh, Justice League in the, the current incarnation that I've been reading in the comics, they're probably 15 dice characters at least. Um, it could be argued Superman's probably closer to an eight die, 18 die level. Well, you know, again, just redonkulous as they like to say. Uh, so, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and so, you know, there's, 
there's different levels that this game can work at and it's a lot a lot of fun so while we're just kind of hanging out since that's what we're doing right now does anybody who is watching uh either in the kickstarter live feed or in the facebook live feed have any other questions uh gregory scott james oh so yeah thanks uh appreciate with the the the, the good luck there gregory i appreciate you wish uh wish you could have joined us over here to play but you know, I say over here because I'm pointing at the screen that I have the Kickstarter thing on. Uh, can you raise edge with points or is that a static number based off other stats? So, I mean, there'd be no point uh, in specifically pointing, spending points on edge, uh, Michael Walsh. Um, uh, the way you would do that is you raise your agility or, well, I mean, perception is your default, right? So um, we, we the, it's really kind of cool. Perception, your awareness of what's going around you is your core one of your core edge stats. So raising your perception would affect it. If your agility is higher than your intellect, then raising your agility would be the other way to go. Um, you may as well spend the point on agility rather than just spending the point on edge. Uh, and if you went the intellect route, I'm, perce I'm perceptive and I'm smart, and that's how come I have a high edge, then you would raise your intellect. Um, the other thing that you can do to jack your edge up is there's straight up a thing called lightning reflexes. And that is a power you can buy that straight up just goes boom plus six. Uh, on top of your edge. So those are the ways that you would raise your edge, but there's not a separate power for that. Um, you know, there is super speed, which I think if I remember correctly, it's three times your super speed rank is your edge at that point. Cause well, you're just ridiculously going to, you're ridiculously fast. Edge by the way, is your initiative. And typically in most games, you're going to have it where it's just going to be static. So it's nice and fast, right? First, you know, fastest edge just go first. And then we go through you know, down to the lowest edge. After that, with minions, minions don't even have edge, they just go last. Uh, if there's ever a tie between a hero and a villain, the hero gets to go first. If there's a tie between two heroes, uh, then you go to whichever of them has uh, the highest perception or whatever, or they just can negotiate. Like, you, you'll tell you what, you just go ahead and go first. You know, there's just, just different ways you can do that. Um, if you want, however, the random effect, if you want the, 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 the push-pull not certain what's going to happen, uh, and I do this for, for like big battles and important battles in my games. I have everybody roll their edge, which can be really funny when like the super speeds has got 30 something dice has to like find, you know, the players to find 30 something dice to roll. Usually what they'll do is about half of them. They'll declare, I'm just going to do auto success because that is of course the thing you can do in this game. Auto success means uh, for every two dice, you don't roll, you just get a success. So if I've got like 34 dice of, of uh, a or 34 edge, because I'm a super speedster, I'll go ahead and take my 10 auto successes for 20 of those dice and then I'll roll the other 14 dice to see what else I get. Uh, it's still probably going to give me a pretty a decent result. Um, or I can just take the um, uh, the 17 and say, you know, there, that's what I'm going. But everybody else can roll, and they might get a bunch of sixes, because sixes count double, remember. And they might get to go a lot faster than they normally would. That's always the time. That's always the reason why you would roll instead of not rolling, because you can auto-success any roll. Anytime you want to roll... Or anytime you want to have a, a challenge where you don't want to roll and leave it to random chance, you, as Len calls it, take the average, and you just take one success for every two dice that you don't roll, and you can go on. But you don't have the chance for rolling sixes, so you don't have that chance for, like, the extraordinary successes. So it's a tactical and, and strategic kind of decision there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that edge does get to determine when you go and that kind of thing. However, I will point out that you can always spend a resolve to just jump the order. Uh, did that very recently in the Well of the World game where my character felt like I felt like my character really needed to go first no matter what was going on. So as soon as we all generated our edge results, because we rolled, uh, I went ahead and spent my resolve and jumped to the very top of the order and went then because Garda, the character I was playing, had to go first for that for that page. And then if somebody else wanted to also spend, then we'd have to compare edge from there. So that's that's you know, straight up. So basically you can run your initiative very uh, champion style. High decks, high decks to low decks is how that used to work in Champions. Um, or you can do it random, and both are valid. Uh, Donnie Arnold's on. Good to see you, brother. And I'm, I, I want to say, um, I'm looking again, because basically we're broadcasting to two places, and I'm having to sort of pay attention to two screens. I'm broadcasting straight to the Facebook page, or straight to the Kickstarter page, but it's rebroadcasting over to the Facebook page. So now I'm having to kind of pay attention. And again, I, I would have loved to have had some people on for the demoing. And that didn't happen. Uh, yeah, at this point, 121, uh, I would be able to like run a really quick something if somebody wanted to jump in and be a character. I'm still looking for that, by the way. If anybody wants to 
come to the Kickstarter page because that uh, you're going to have to be on the Kickstarter page. Use the QA thing and say, hey, I would like to play. I'll send you a link. So go ahead and jump in as a co-host and we'll set something up. It may not be the full demo I'd originally planned, but we'll, we'll run you through uh, an encounter of some kind. So you can kind of just roll some dice and see how it goes because that's, that's what this is for. So if there's anybody who would like to help me show this game off, I am, I am ready. I'm looking for someone to do that because I've got 15 people now watching on the Kickstarter page. And if any of you people who are in the, the, the people that I'm looking at, uh, Mark Morgan, Rob Fitch, Danny Atwood, uh, I see either Jeff Arbo or Mike, uh, Michael Knight of Spyglass Games. Hi, guys. Love to see you guys. Uh, Bill Keys. Hey, dude, if you want to help me show some, how, something how, off how this works, I'd love for you to help me. And they're like, it says there's eight more, but I can't see uh, who it is. Um, but if anybody wants to pop in, drop a note in the QA. Uh, part of the thing that will let me know that you would like to play. And I will then use that to give you the link so that you can come in as a co-host with camera microphone and then uh, grab one of the pre-gen characters and play. The folks who are currently watching over here uh, off to my right on Facebook, uh, unfortunately uh, you'd have to come over to the other thing to do that. What would classic 1960s Superman dice cap be? Oh, geez. Uh, if we're talking the one that could move the moon around, uh, he's probably in the 20 to 24 dice at least. Um, you know, that's, you know, back when, when he was like strong enough to pick a car up, but it kind of looked like he was struggling, but then he would turn around and move the moon because what, I mean, what, it was always about what, whatever the, uh, writers wanted. Uh, but, um, uh, the typical examples of just the ridiculous overpowered Superman, uh, minimum 20 dice, probably closer to like 24 dice kind of thing. You know, uh, it's easier for me to say if someone wants to say, well, you know, here's the biggest thing I remember that he picked up and then I can look it up and tell you, uh, you know, that, uh, okay, it was probably, it was probably this die level then. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, going back to the, the might chart, just to kind of give people a sense of that kind of thing. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so at, say, 15 dice, a character can regularly pick up a kiloton. At 20 dice, six, 50 kilotons. At 24 dice, one megaton. And then... You know, and you can just extend it from there. That's as high as the chart goes, just because at that point, you know, whatever. But you can, it, it's a, it's the scale is easy to flow. So if a GM really needs to know what 30 dice or 40 or 50 dice does, you just, it's basic math. I mean, I could figure it out right now, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do math live online every more than I have to. <laughs> um, that was, that was a slightly creepy statement, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for making things a little bit awkward. <laughs> All right, so um, you know what? At this point, you know, it's coming up on 1.30, and I do not have any volunteers to actually play the game with me, which is sad making. So I will just have to kind of talk it through a little bit and show you guys uh, what would happen, say, for example, if TK, which is one of the pre-gen characters in the Quick Start Rules, found herself battling a bunch of killer robots... On uh, in the streets of uh, Pinnacle City. So uh, in this case, we're going to say there's three killer robots. Uh, the stats for the killer robots are right here. They have an edge of of eight and a health of six. Although in this case, they're foes. Because they're foes, they're only going to have a health of three. You cut the you cut the health rating in half for foes because they're easy to go through. Uh, killer robots have an agility of two D. They're kind of awkward. I mean, they're not they're not like completely clumsy, but they're not superhumanly capable and they're so they're low human average um they're not really bright they're kind of like automated uh, remote control things and intellective 2d might have 60 so they're pretty pretty strong they could tip up small car over perception 60 because good senses toughness 60 because well they're tough and not much of a willpower just 2d um their powers they have uh armor of 60 a blast energy zorch of 8d uh, communication 60, so they can like plug into communication systems and receive word, whatever. They are inanimate, so they are not alive. They are they're immune to things like poison and things that would affect living organic things. And they have night vision. 
They have the flaws of emotionless, which means they just they have no emotions, nothing to appeal to, and you know they cannot sense what life is. Uh, and repair, meaning they cannot be healed. They would have to be fixed by somebody. So we're going to say there's three of those bad boys stomping around. Apex has released them into the streets and is causing all kinds. They're causing all kinds of damage. He's testing out his uh, robot army that he wishes to unleash for his uh, purposes. TK is first on the scene. TK, of course, uh, you might imagine, is a telekinetic. So she arrives and sees these guys. They have an edge of eight. Her edge is also eight. So they would be tied. However, she's a hero. So she will still get to go first. So the first thing she's going to do, she has force field area 12D. Uh, so it has the pro area, so she can create a large dome-like or circle-like whatever. So she's going to encapsulate these guys. It says right here, TK can reject a force field that grants protected characters 12D passive defense against physical and energy attacks and makes them immune to attacks with a rank of six dice or less. If she wishes, she can make the force field large enough to shield everything within a close range of her. In this case, however, she's going to do it in, in the inverse. She's going to use it basically to ensnare these guys. She's going to put a dome over them to uh, to try to contain these uh, robots. So that is her action. She goes, clump. Here's my uh, area force field of 12 dice. And the robots are now trapped inside of it, and it's going to be their turn. Now, uh, I'm currently using TK's sheet on a screen, and I've only got two screens. So give me a second while I go over and check to see if, uh, make sure I'm not missing anything over on the Facebook side of things. Uh, uh, my, Michael Walsh, um, just, I'm going to stick to the schedule. So, um, you know, uh, I would love to have you join in anytime. So, uh, I think the next one, uh, is to do, 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 when is the next one? The next one is March 26th on Tuesday. So, um, make sure if you're available, please to join in for that one. Cause that would be great. Uh, all right. So, uh, let's. See if anybody else is Jack Hollingsworth. Hey, Jack, good to see you. Rebecca, everyone, good to see you guys over there. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anybody. So we got to the point where TK flew in and, and uh, looked at these robots and said, uh, that's enough out of you. Um, uh, you guys just need to stop causing all this trouble. Now, the robots uh, quickly analyze the situation. Uh, and of course, they're stupid because of 2D intellect. However, because they are, they have the communications ability, and Apex is clearly in the background watching what's going on and testing them. He will, in fact, make sure that they understand that what they're going to need to do is kind of team up on this force wall to make sure that they can get out of it. So uh, they're going to coordinate their blasts to try to break this force field. Now they have eight die blasts. So they are, it is technically possible. If they were, if their blasts were six dice or less, they couldn't, they would be, even if they teamed up, there's no way they could get out. Uh, it would be the same as if like a bunch of people took 45 caliber pistols and shot at an M1 Abrams tank just because they're all shooting at the same time. They still couldn't hurt the tank. That's the same case situation here. But they do have eight dice blast. So they're going to use what is called the teamwork maneuver. And teamwork means they will wait to the end of the page, which is very easy in this case because they were going last anyway and there's nobody else in the fight. So they all wait to the end and then they team up. And by teaming up, each of them gets 10 dice because they get plus two dice if you team up and you wait and do teamwork. Everybody gets plus two dice in their attack. And uh, they, uh, if they want, they could spend, in this case, it would be adversity instead of resolve. Adversity is what I get to spend instead of the players to make their sixes explode. So they're also going to go all out. Now, all out is another maneuver that you can do, and that gives you an additional plus two dice, but it does cut your defenses in half. So we're going to go ahead and roll 12 dice to represent one of the killer robots blasting this, um, this force wall. And what I'm doing is I'm rolling the dice, and I'm counting evens. I rolled really, really well. I am currently pulling out a whole bunch of even dice. Uh, so TK may be in some serious trouble here. Uh, two, four, so you know, I got these really cool dice that uh, David Forby and, and uh, Kim Myers Forby made for us. Uh, so they've got the PNP logo. Those are the sixes on this. So that's, because those are sixes, they each count for two successes each. So it becomes four by itself. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 
The first robot rolled 12 successes. Now, TK, her force field is 12 dice, so she's just going to roll that. And we'll see how well she her, she can maintain concentration to hold that up. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good at all, unfortunately. So, yeah, she only rolled five successes. So, you know, they all teamed up, so they all went. So the the, the scene, the narrative scene would be, Kazak, 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 you know, they, they all three blasted as hard as they could. And she, like, you know, because it's her the, the force of her will, she kind of staggers back and it kind of gives her a slight headache as the force wall completely shreds. But that was their action. So they're done. And so she gets to go again. And we come back around. And the other power that she has is telekinesis, also area. She it's a she TK is a very powerful character. Uh, by the way, she's flying right now because she can use her telekinetic ability to fly. So she TK is a staggeringly powerful telekinetic who can lift up to 100 tons with her mind. She can use this power to perform attacks and active defenses against physical attacks, as well as to grab, lift, and otherwise manipulate objects at up to distant range. So because she has the area ability, she can go after all three of these robots at once because they were contained in an area. So she's gonna the way she's gonna describe this is that she's gonna take her whole her telekinetic force and then just kind of grab them all and smash them together in one you know attack. So uh, what's gonna happen here uh, is she's gonna roll her twelve dice again. So we're gonna go ahead and roll. And as always, gamers, you know we throw our dice on the floor. So she'll roll her twelve dice. That's another couple of sixes. Two four. Oh, there's another one. Two four six but everything else was odd. Ouch! Like all ones and fives aside from those. So TK normally has three resolve. She's going to spend one of those resolve to re-roll that roll because that was just not what she wanted. So she's going to go ahead and, and go all in because she wants to protect the city. She's the only one there uh, against them at this point. Uh, so she's going to re-roll. Oh, that was ugly. That was even worse. You know, so she'll get to stay on the best roll she had. And the best roll she had was eight. I had two six, I had three sixes, a two, and a four. So two, four, six, seven, eight. So that would have been eight successes. This last, the second one was bad. So she's better resolved, but it was even worse. So she gets to keep her best resolve. Now, uh, now I roll for the killer robots. The killer robots have armor 6D and agility 2D. So armor 6D would be their passive defense because they just kind of take it, uh, whereas 2D would be their active defense. So they're going to take their best defense um, in this case. And also active defense, unfortunately, you only get half ranks unless you give up your next action versus area effect attacks anyway. Uh, so they're going to use their armor. However, because they went all out, they only get half of their armor. So instead of the 6D, they only get to roll 3D to represent that they were totally exposed by going all out. So she had eight successes. The first one rolls three successes. Uh, so eight minus three is five. They only have three health. That one is smashed. The second one rolled four successes, but that's still not enough to keep it from being smashed to bits. And the last one rolls, yep, two successes. So she showed up on the scene and wrapped them up in a bubble. They teamed up to blast that bubble into smithereens, but then she grabbed all three of them, kaplang, and smashes them into bits. So you've got now... Apex created killer robot pieces laying on the floor. Uh, however, a whole horde of smaller uh, killer robots come streaming down the street. These would be minions, by the way. Looks like there's like 40 of them. Uh, things just made out of all kinds of pieces of junk and given some sort of weird sentience, like drones that have been given extra whatever, and they've been coming in as minions. Fortunately for her, that's when Citizen Soldier, Vigilant, and Alabama Slammer show up on the scene and say, hey, uh, need some help, and well, if we had players playing, I'd I'd run that scene, uh, but we're just going to let that stand as a uh, as a dramatic pause in the story. But that at least I you know I took a few minutes here kind of just show you the basics of combat, right? The push pull. Uh, she had an action she wanted to take. She she decided to use her air effect telekinesis to to wrap the robots up. They got to, to use a cool maneuver uh, called teamwork. Uh, and it also went all out so that they could make sure they could smash through it. 
but then it was her turn and she used her area effect telekinesis. And again, there was any number of ways she could have done that, but because of the way this game works, she was allowed to describe it as I'm using area telekinetics to just grab them and smash them together. Totally works. Totally cool, creative way. She could have done any number of things. She could have, you know, grabbed the car and smashed them with the car. Uh, she could have lifted them all up into the air and caused them to fall to the ground. Any number of ways that she wanted to describe that would all still have worked as an area effect attack against a whole group of killer robots because they were foes. They were slightly easier to affect. And so she was able to take them out pretty quickly. Uh, so that would have just been a really great opening scene in the comic book. And then, like I said, I'd have this horde of minions coming in as these smaller robots are attacking, uh, which, by the way, is inspired by a, a scene out of a webcomic I'm reading right now called Delta Dawn, where this guy has uh, technopath powers and he's just like building these weird doggo robot type things with, with machine guns on them. So, you know, but then I would have the other three pre-gen characters show up and then we would continue running that and it would be a, a minion battle where they're like, every time you do a hit a point of damage, it's basically a minion goes down. And then at some point they would have to face off with Apex himself. So, you know, that's straight up classic comic book fun. So looking back over at the Facebook place, uh, Donnie Arnold saying my next character creation will be Dr. Hoshasen, a nuclear powered villain that mutates his victims into anthropomorphic rabbit people. So the victims are volunteers who employees and gives firearms. These followers are known as gun bunnies. Ouch, Donnie. Ouch, you're making my brain hurt. Oh, uh, that does sound like a lot of fun. Uh, actually, God, that would be a great villain for a Mystery Men type game. Uh, let's see. Are you going to post all the character stats you use today on the Facebook page? Uh, well, I mean, um, the, the pre-gens, of course, are in the quick start. Uh, as far as the killer robots, yeah, I'll, I'll post those up. Um, Apex, uh, yeah, I'll share Apex's stats. Why not? Yeah, we can do that. I'll, uh, that's a good idea. So when I get done um, on the Prowlers and Paragons uh, Ultimate Edition Facebook page, so inclusive, an exclusive for people following the PNP UE page on Facebook. Uh, I will post the killer robot stats and I will post Apex's stats. No, actually, I'm not going to post Apex's stats. You didn't fight Apex. Well, nobody fought Apex. Um, but I will post the killer robot stats. Um, and if people show up and play, then the stats of whatever it is they've went up against, uh, you know, I'll, I will share at least one of the characters uh, involved in one of the things when we play. So today, I'll, like I said, I'll post the killer robot stats. The killer robot stats are basically in a section of the core rules uh, for just basic, you know, basic archetype enemy things that people could encounter and fight, uh, just as a quick, real you know, grab and go kind of thing for for gaming. Uh, and Lens put a whole bunch of them. Like the one page I'm looking at right now, uh, there's a standard demon, a standard killer robot, lost world native, and ninja. Right. So ninja. Why did it have to be ninjas? So there's also a high tech ninja type too. Oh, God, and the burrow bunnies. Yeah, Donnie's just going a little berserk over there on the Facebook page. Uh, and for the Arctic minions, those would be... Okay, they're, we're not going to talk to them anymore. The Facebook people are being bad. Um, they've gone off on bunny puns and weird bunny names for different types of bunny-themed bad guys. So they're bad, and we should shun them because they're doing bad things over there. That's. I'm just saying, over we over here on the Kickstarter main page, you know, we're good people. We're not making bad bunny puns. I love all of you for that, so no problem. Uh, over there on the Facebook feed, they're being very bad. And uh, fine, we'll hop over. Mark Morgan, I will. Don't you, Mark, because he's on both. That's the problem. He's on both. He's a spy. He's a dirty spy for the Facebook bad people, and he's over here on the Kickstarter good people page and now he's going to you know make them come over and we're not all bad you you are david forby you are you are a participant you, you are a, a, a you're guilty by association guilty by leaders in the bunny legion jackrabbit jackalope he donnie's just gone crazy someone please help donnie stop him before he creates another bunny thing again and it's not even it's not even bill keys it's freaking donnie bill keys by the way our director of operations and our art our, our art director for Evil Bill Games, and is also the creator of the um, uh, Blood and Justice Shadows of Nocturne setting that we would like to uh, publish at some point. Um, he's also known as the Evil Bunny, and so his whole thing is bunny stuff. So he's going to love this when he sees it later, I'm sure. 
Uh, did it, did it, did it. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Mr. James. I appreciate the kindness. Um, uh, you know, like I said, it was just a real quick kind of show off. I, uh, I, I hate doing it that way. I would rather players be able to engage directly with the experience. Um, and I'm really hoping that the, the rest of the, the, uh, scheduled demos, we will have at least one or more players to participate so that we have a more interactive experience with some narrative and some play. Uh, but at the very least, you know, just kind of give you guys a sense of just how fast and quick the game is. I mean, it, it really is. But the thing is, it's 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 fast and quick without being um, too rules light. If you understand my meaning there, um, uh, this is this is the kind of thing. It's kind of like for for those who've been gaming a long time. You know, there's there's been the classic, very math heavy games of the old days because that's where we come from. You know, it was this, the war games and simulations and things like that, and you had the really elaborate and involved systems and they were amazing for those of us who were really into it. That, that was a thing. And then we had sort of a, a different, completely different mindset come along and some would call it an overcorrection, but I wouldn't, I'd say that it was fun for what those people wanted to do. I've highly simplified, like just roll a die and boom, there it is, you know, or very, very simplistic games that just get quick resolutions. Didn't quite give you the same sense of my character has some unique abilities and that means, you know, I feel special it's more like, well, I'm just kind of here. We're rolling some dice. And it's fun. It's it's more just pure narrative. Get into it with a couple of random rolls to kind of switch things up. Perfectly fine way to play. There's no bad fun, but not what I was looking for either. So for me, you know, I was looking for that thing. I was looking to create something that was in the middle, uh, something that had some satisfying crunch without being overburdened with simulationist mechanics. And it was very easy for people to get into, but when they got into it, they could go, oh, but I can take these pieces and I can do some more things with them and I can actually make very involved, elaborate characters if that's my style. And I can have powers that are like meaningfully interesting. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's just not that hard to figure out what's going on or how to play. Um, I've taught brand new players who've never played any role-playing game before at all how to play this game and they love it. And they've been asking me, you know, when can we play again? And that's very satisfying. Uh, at the same time, I've got established long-time superhero gaming fans of decades experience saying this is their favorite superhero game ever. Again, very, very satisfying. Um, you know, the forward of uh, 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 defining moments. Yes, okay, uh, let me let me get to that in a minute. Um, the forward uh, describes my story about how I was designing my own game, which was going to be giant handfuls of six-sided dice. It was literally called Handfuls of Dice. And then Savage Rifts came along and I wasn't going to be able to spend any time on it, but I still wanted to do supers at the time. And then I discovered my friend's game that he'd actually sent me and I had not paid attention to it, but I opened it up and I got into it and I was like, oh, this is a better game than I was going to design anyway. And then we worked for five years to make it even better because it's just that solid fun a game and lends a brilliant designer. Defining moments. Okay, all right, I'll, uh, I'll get into, uh, I'm literally going to go straight to the book for that one though, because that one, uh, that one is, is, is worth just sort of a, uh, a dramatic reading and by the way i'm gonna polish both the knuckles and go who's the one who came up with defining moments this guy yeah i'm very i'm very proud of that now len you know helped me perfect it he he looked at it we went back and forth uh, we argued we fought we laughed we cried we laughed and cried some more we threw large rocks at each other and then and then we had uh, a really good defining moment uh so let me just find that defining moments here we go all right so i'm just going to go ahead and read this out loud for everybody so you guys know what this is because this is a pretty special piece of this and this kind of goes to some rules design ideas that i've had that you that some of you have been following my work for a while would recognize from like savage riffs uh, the concept of the blades of glory and this is not the exact same thing but the idea of, of a special way that the player can just invoke a time and a moment to do something mechanically and narratively important for them. So whether you're a solo act, part of a local team, or a member of an international league, there are times when everything rests on your shoulders. When that happens, you always have the option of declaring that as a finding, a defining moment. This does two things. First, any sixes you roll explode. They count as two successes. You get to roll those dice again to try fresh successes, and you can keep re-rolling them as long as you keep rolling sixes. And sometimes that can re result in some ridiculous stuff. Uh, second, it was, it's, 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 second, every point of resolve you spend on that challenge uh, roll earns you three dice, extra dice, instead of the usual one extra die. So resolve is the 
chips or tokens or whatever that you can have that represent. And if, if you were paying attention to the demo-ish thing I did, where TK spent a resolve to re-roll her dice, she could have also spent a resolve to add additional dice to the roll. So, for example, uh, you know, you 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 almost hit or you barely hit, but you didn't really do a whole lot of damage. Uh, so you and you've got a nice stack of resolve. You spend three of them to add three more dice to the result. So that's a thing that you can do with resolve. <clears throat> now, in a defining moment situation, those three chips you spent would become plus nine dice on your roll. So suddenly you are blowing the doors off. So despite the name, defining moments can last longer than an instant. For example, a hero with super strength might declare a defining moment when they need to hold up a collapsing building long enough for the civilians inside to escape, even though the building would normally be much too heavy to lift. So you might have, you know, Colossus, you know, trying to hold up something that's too much, but he's like, ah, he's like straining and his arms are bulging. He's like tearing muscles inside his metal skin, but he's holding the building up because defining moment. Um, Da -da -da -da. Similarly, a defining moment could involve attempting to defuse an impossibly complex alien bomb or negotiating a peace treaty between militant factions that have been at war for centuries. So it could be anything, right? You could be trying to make a charm roll between the, the, the factions of two alien societies and you go defining moment and throw all it in so that you can say exactly the right thing to make that perfect uh, impassioned speech. Uh, you can only declare one defining moment per story. Additionally, because these are instances where everything rests on you, only one hero can declare a defining moment per scene. Although heroes who happen to uh, heroes uh, in different scenes, different locations, different times, whatever, can declare defining moments that just happen to occur at the same time. So it's like there was, you know, a global disaster, and in four different zones, you know, f four of the heroes were, you know, separately from each other. They could each do a defining moment that way. But if they're all in the same scene, only one of them can do the defining moment. Uh, do, 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 do. Most importantly, defining moments can take take their toll on you. Once a defining moment is over, you must permanently reduce one of your abilities by one die. If your defining moment involved a physical task, you have to reduce agility, might, or toughness. If it involved a mental task, you have to reduce intellect, perception, or willpower. Although the reduction is permanent, this doesn't prevent you from spending hero points to raise that ability in the future. So basically, you lose a hero point for doing a defining moment. And that's not a bad cost, but it's a meaningful cost. Putting these mechanical considerations aside, defining moments should be rare and special. You shouldn't expect to have one every issue or even every story. Heroes are constantly fighting the good fight, challenging villains, protecting civilians, and doing what they can to make the world a better place. None of that rises to the level of a defining moment. It's only when you find yourself in a situation that rests entirely on your shoulders, involves your allies or someone you love, or speaks directly to why you became a hero in the first place, and why your motivation keeps you doing it, that a defining moment is appropriate. There's an extra rule for uh, one-shots. Um, if you're playing a convention game or any one-shot game where you don't expect to use your hero again, the idea of reducing one of your abilities by one day doesn't mean very much. Accordingly, in one-shot games, defining moments are more debilitating. After you resolve your defining moment, your health drops to zero, and you will fall unconscious. You regain your wits at the end of the current scene, but suffer a minus two die penalty to all challenge rolls for the rest of the story. GMs may wish to allow heroes in ordinary games to choose this option rather than reducing one of their abilities by 1D, but that's entirely optional. So anyway, there's two different ways to, to, to have the defining moment have an impact. And yes, that is one of the really special things about this game. That's one of those extra details that really uh, pulls this game out of just here's a raw set of mechanics to do superheroes. You know, here's a special and meaningful mechanic that really makes this game a step above and brings out something special about being superheroes. It's what gives you that moment where Steve Rogers at the end of Infinity War is holding Thanos' hand back, and Thanos is actually stopping and looking at him for a second. I mean, granted, at the end, it didn't matter as much narratively, but it just looked amazing, and you could totally make that a defining moment. Or alternatively, when he grabs the helicopter, and he's keeping the helicopter from flying away, He's super strong, but he's not Thor or Hulk strong. So that was really much harder for him. And it completely changed the situation. Uh, again, that could have been a defining moment. So those are those are two pretty cool cinematic examples. Uh, do, 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 do. So I'm back over checking the Facebook to make sure you know they're not still doing horrible bunny things. Uh, do, 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 do. Simple math, good way to teach math for kids. Uh, that's true. I have somebody uh, who's played who... Math is not her strong suit. Uh, it's 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 not her easiest thing, but she enjoys playing because it kind of stretches those muscles for her. 
Uh, yes, Spider-Man Homecoming, where Spider-Man lifts an entire collapsed warehouse. That is another great defining moment. In fact, it's right out of the original Spider-Man comics, although different situation, but where he thought it you know, was all going to be over, but he somehow manages to pull it out. That the, the moment in Spider-Man Homecoming where he lifts that thing up off of himself, that is absolutely a defining moment. Are there instances of predestined failure applicable to defining moments? Seduce Wonder Woman, etc. I don't... Hmm. Let me see if I can parse that. Um, that's really going to have to be a matter of the GM and the player discussing that. Um, you know, as a GM, if somebody were trying to do a defining moment to do something ridiculous that just really didn't fit the story and was going to kind of mess things up, I would, I would call a halt and I would say, what you're asking to do here uh, is not conducive to the setting or the story. Um, it's, I just, I want to go ahead and say, I just, I do not feel that is an appropriate use of defining moment. If I felt strongly that what they were doing was, was going to be damaging to the narrative. That's incredibly rare. Most of the time I, I trust that the players are going to come up with something cool and meaningful. And if they do so, then the defining moment should apply. Uh, so seducing Wonder Woman, uh, you know, I don't see a player using a defining moment because it feels frivolous. And if it is frivolous, which in that case it would be, in my opinion, then it wouldn't be a defining moment and it wouldn't work. Right. Well, I just I want to I want to seduce Wonder Woman because ha ha ha. No, no, that's basically you're trying to effectively control that character and make her be something she's not with your defining moment. That's that's icky and not cool. So I wouldn't allow it. Uh, that's just straight up. I'd say the defining moment doesn't work. Um, fortunately, I've not had to deal with that. I've had people use their defining moments to do really amazing, cool, fun stuff. Uh, defining moments so thematic for comic books. Yes, Nick, absolutely. Uh, well, wow, I'm glad the defining moments is the thing that sold the game for you. <laughs> that's that's cool. Uh, yay, team. We're at 152, so eight minutes left for this broadcast today. Uh, I'm actually going to be spending uh, the rest of the day putting together some other stuff for the Kickstarter and doing some work on modern gods because whether we get it uh, unlocked during the Kickstarter or or not, uh, that book's got to get done and it will be a sending book that we publish just may take longer uh, to get it done. And I've got to really work on that, but let's do the numbers as Kai Rizdal is fond of saying. Uh, we are currently at $17,329 and 247 backers. Now I did say that there was a special unlock, a, 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 a target goal unlock that could be uh, one of two things. So if we can get to $18,000 or if we get to 250 backers at that time, I will officially announce another unlocked PDF and adventure to be written by a very dear friend of mine, a very well-known writer and designer in the games industry. He and I have worked together before. Uh, we've both done stuff for each other's products. Um, he's uh, brilliant in all kinds of different genres. I'm very excited about the possibility of announcing him. So we need three more backers. If we get three more backers during this broadcast in the next six minutes, I can I can announce who that is. I can announce uh, the the the. I don't have an adventure name yet because we still have to work all that out. But I can announce who's going to be doing a special adventure for Prowls and Paragons, and it will be one of the PDFs that people who got at the PDF level or higher will be able to get, like the forty dollar level, I think it is. So uh, three more backers, even like three backers at a dollar, which is cheesy, but I'll allow it. Uh, or $18,000, which would be lots better, thanks, because we need to get those numbers moving, folks. We've got to get to 28, uh, and right now we're not even at 18. So, you know, uh, yes, 15 days left. I'm pretty certain that we'll get there, but it'd be really nice to go ahead and get there now because if we can get that momentum going again, get more excitement out there, people are going to look at the Kickstarter and go, oh, I want to get involved in this. It's weird because people want to back Kickstarters that are already successful, not realizing that if they go ahead and back, then they can help make it successful. It's a weird psychology thing, but you know, it is what it is. So, do, 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 do. oh, thank you, Gregory Scott James. I appreciate that. Um, so, anyway, um, we need three more backers uh, in the next five minutes, uh, or better yet, $18,000. Uh, I will point out, by the way, that we still have one of the architect of the universe pledges left. So that one is like a major one. Uh, and we still have seven of the 10 super genius or evil mastermind levels left. So those are the big dollar ones. Those are the ones where you get to help build and put stuff into the game world. 
Uh, and so for those of you who, you know, are really all in and want to be a huge part of this, we've got three people who have done that, which is awesome. We could, you know, but we have some more slots left for there. And we have one slot available for whoever wants to pop in and go, boom, mic drop. I want to be an architect. Uh, you get to add two characters to the core book. Uh, you also include an adventure that will be designed and specifically tailored to the heroes of Prowls and Paragons Ultimate Edition in uh, premium quality hardcover format. This one with the alternate cover by Jerry Gaylord, who did the original book. So that's that's what you would get. Um, and anybody who plays at that level, I would probably also say you get to have uh, at least one character or something added to the Modern God setting as well. I mean, that's I'm just saying. Somebody comes in and, and does something like that, I will probably let them play in my Modern Gods universe as well, in addition to getting to play with the PNP world. Uh, the Pinnacle City world, actually, because there's a Pinnacle City setting, which is the core setting that's endemic to the core PNP book and the villain, the, the Pinnacle City's most wanted book. Uh, and then there's Modern Gods, which is a separate setting, but it's within the same omniverse, the omniverse concept. I think you guys have heard a lot of you heard me talk about this before, but this is a meta concept. It interconnects multiple settings, not just uh, officially published settings, but also settings published by you. People who want to use, we're going to set up a fan oriented uh, thing, which uh, Drive Through RPG does. Uh, fan created content, I think it's called. I'm actually looking up to be sure I'm saying this correctly. Uh, but uh, there's a whole and a lot of a lot of companies are doing this now. A lot of companies have have gotten involved in in this uh, in this concept. Uh, I'm just waiting for the page to finish loading. Community content, that's what it's called. So we are going to have a community content uh, program as soon as we get this stuff up and running and launched on on uh, for, re for regular retail release. And the community content program will be very similar, very similar to what uh, uh, Pinnacle Entertainment's doing. Uh, so we will definitely have it available for third-party uh, publishers to do, but also for fans to create their own things and put it up. Uh, we'll try to get some resources out there to help you do that. And uh, you'll be able to publish within the Omniverse concept. And therefore, it's like, here's my setting, or here's my group of villains that could be a group of villains in anybody's omniverse setting, and they can cross over. And it's, it's all considered more part of one giant shared gaming experience. And again, you know, I'm all about the innovation. No one's ever done that. No one's ever done quite that kind of thing, where it's not just that we, it's open for you to create content, but it's open for you to create content that you can treat as canonical within the meta construct of the omniverse. So I've created this thing, and it's officially now part of the omniverse. And so people can play that these characters or that faction ends up in the modern God setting or, you know, it, it goes into the modern God setting, but then, it, you know, whatever crisis it creates spills out into Pinnacle city. And then maybe uh, characters from uh, the blood and justice nocturne shadows of nocturne setting will also team up. And, you know, so you get to create stuff and make stuff to play with, and you could grab all these things and say, this is all part of my campaign because it's all omniverse. Again, I don't think anybody's ever done that. Scott Carm and, and me and a few others uh, worked on this idea some time ago. Uh, we were doing it for like a more meta thing that would connect all game systems and settings potentially. That was a bit too ambitious, but I never gave up on the idea. And Scott like came up with really, really great concepts. So I really want us to bring that back alive within this contained concept that we have a little bit more control over. But again, it's superheroes, so anything's possible. So some grand gigantic, you know, super fantasy thing where they carry swords bigger than themselves and, uh, you know, summon the monsters that hang out for a few seconds and destroy everything. Final Fantasy! You know, that could totally be a superhero setting that's part of the Omniverse. So that's the kind of thing that we're putting together. We've got one minute left. So uh, this was fun. It wasn't exactly what I was hoping to do. Like I said, I was hoping to get players on to actually play. And I'm hoping that for the next one, that we will have that. Uh, we are still at 17, 329, and 247 backers, so we did not hit that reveal yet. So we'll have to hope that happens sometime later today, and when it does, I'll just put it on a general announcement. Uh, real quick, even though we, we've hit the time, but I'm going to go ahead and, and remind everyone, the uh, and I've scheduled all of these. These are, these are scheduled and ready to go. The next of these, uh, the next official broadcast in which we will do specifically a demo, will be March 26th, which is Tuesday, next Tuesday, 4 p.m. MST, 6 p.m. EST, 3 p.m. PST. Uh, the next one will be March 29th, which is that following Friday, uh, 5 o'clock Mountain Time. Then March 31st, Sunday, 3 o'clock Mountain Time. April 2nd, which is a Tuesday, 5 o'clock Mountain. April 4th, which is a Thursday, 7 o'clock Mountain Time. And then the last one will be April 6th, which is at Saturday, 10 a.m. Mountain, 
noon Eastern, nine Pacific. That will be the very last one. After that will be uh, Monday, starting at 10 a.m. Mountain, noon, noon Eastern, um, nine, uh, nine Pacific, will be the beginning of the 24-hour epic countdown, the last 24 hours of the Kickstarter, which I'll be broadcasting live the entire time for you guys to join in, watch me be completely goofy and crazy. We'll do contests. We'll have fun. We'll make up new stuff. We'll, we'll go for the big push to see where we are with the Kickstarter at that point. Who knows what kind of crazy free stuff I'll be giving away or other insane stuff I'll do. So you'll want to set some time aside for that as well because it's always been a party. Shine Tar, we did it. We did it for Freedom Squadron, and we're going to do it for this one. All right, folks. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I hope that even though this doesn't wasn't the normal, what I originally scheduled, I hope that it was still fun and enjoyable. Uh, we had 14 people, kind of 14, 15 people hanging out with us on this thing. Uh, we had a number of people watching over there on Facebook, which I'm grateful for. But uh, I'm going to call it there. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do another live today. If I do, it's going to be very spontaneous. Uh, but otherwise, I think I'm just going to focus on getting some work done and getting some announcements out there. Um, I truly, truly do appreciate everyone's support. And again, uh, I will encourage you to please share the Kickstarter, share the freebie rules, make sure people get those rules and see them. Um, make sure people know about the schedule for, uh, for future demos. And if you looked at this and said, this would be fun, go ahead, get a camera set up, get a microphone set up, um, go to that link, uh, on the Facebook page, uh, that says, you know, so you can see what, which ones you want to schedule for, or drop me a line directly, SPF at evilbeaglegames.com or hit me up on Facebook or however it is. I'm not, I'm incredibly easy to find one way or another. And let me know when you would like to join in and play so we can get you set up so you can be a part of an actual demo with me next time that we do this. All right, folks, that's going to be it. I'm now going to say, as I usually say, peace out, and the world needs heroes.